Pauline Park, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from New York, USA. You are an activist and one of the founders of the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy, working in local government to fight for transgender rights. In today's interview, we'll look at the many misconceptions and false beliefs surrounding transgender people and the subject of transgender rights, as well as hearing your own incredible story of starting out as a Korean adultee and ending up as one of America's most prominent voices for the trans community. Welcome to the show, Pauline. Um, what sort of day is it over there in New York? Well, Mark, it's about, uh, it's very sunny and very cold, and we're in the middle of a little bit of a cold snap, but uh, you can be assured with global warming that it'll be heating up pretty soon. Uh, so I'm actually appreciating the fact that we're not uh, boiling today as it does during the summer. But other than that, we're just fine. Before we take on the misconceptions that people may have about trans issues and the trans community, let's just hear a brief outline of your own story. Pauline, where did you grow up and when did you first realize that you needed to express who you really were? So I was born in Korea and adopted uh, at the age of seven and a half months by European American parents uh, in Milwaukee grew up on the south side of Milwaukee. Uh, my parents were Christian fundamentalists. Um, and so I was precocious enough to realize that I couldn't really talk about sexuality or gender identity issues with them. Um, I knew I was transgendered from an earliest age. Um, people always ask, how do you know? You just know. But I could tell a story about how I knew at the age of four, um, but I had a very long and somewhat challenging period of coming to terms with uh, my gender identity. Um, it's never easy to come out as gay or lesbian, but it's easier, it's more difficult to come out as transgender. So I actually had two comings out. My first was my gay coming out, just as I was turning 18, uh, when I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as an undergraduate. And then my second coming out 18 years later, at the age of 36, uh, when I moved here to Queens, living in Jackson Heights in western Queens. Um, as with anyone, there's a complicated, perhaps interesting story. Uh, those are, that's the broad outline of my, uh, of the process, but in some senses coming out never ends because you're always meeting new people and in effect coming out to new people. And so it's an ongoing process of not only self-realization and self-actualization, but expression and communication with others. I think for anyone who's coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, LGBT, queer, non-binary. There's a process and there are as many different ways to come out and to be trans as there are transgender people. Every individual experience is unique. The commonality is that those who do come out as trans or LGBTQ are doing so most often against the backdrop of a hostile society that's homophobic, biphobic, transphobic. And so that is the point of commonality, I think, for the enormous diversity of stories in the LGBT queer community. Well, there are many suppositions and misconceptions that the trans community have to fend off every day, especially in recent years as trans issues have become a kind of hot button issue in social and political circles. We can't tackle all of these beliefs in today's interview, but we'll try to cover some of the most common ones. Let's start with the idea that sexual orientation is linked to gender identity. So there are two big misconceptions we have to address at the beginning. One is the conflation of sex and gender. The other is the conflation of sexual orientation and gender identity. Sex is not gender, sexual orientation is not gender identity. 
When I was leading the campaign for the transgender rights law enacted by the New York City Council in 2002, I developed an illustration, a kind of graphic to explain this, which I call the circles diagram. And if you go to paulingpark.com and put circles diagram in the search box, it'll come up. Uh, so to begin with, we're all sexed and gendered at birth. We're assigned to a sex and a gender identity based on external genitalia. Now, some people know, although most people don't, that in fact, there are more than two sexes. If you ask the average person on the street how many sexes or genders there are, they'd probably say two and only two. In fact, there's a small but significant population whom we can call intersexed, the old fashioned term which is now somewhat discredited, hermaphrodite is no longer used. Uh, the intersex are those who are not neither entirely female nor entirely male. Um, and so from the very beginning, we have to understand that there are more than two sexes. Obviously with trans people, their gender identity does not necessarily match the gender identity or the sex assigned to them at birth based on external genitalia. Sexual orientation and gender identity also have a very complex relationship and shouldn't be conflated. Sexual orientation obviously refers to those to whom you are attracted. So we ter use terms like heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, but you have to keep in mind that within the trans community, all those sexual orientations are represented. Transgendered people can be heterosexual, gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Sexual orientation and gender identity have a very complex relationship, but they are absolutely not the same. However, I would say that homophobia and transphobia are mutually reinforcing discourses of oppression because both of them are rooted in the sex gendered binary, which is what I was referring to before, the division of the universe into two sexes and two genders, two sexes, male and female, two genders, masculine and feminine. The way I understand it is that there are two mutually reinforcing discourses of oppression, homophobia and transphobia. They're different, but they are both rooted in the sex gender binary, which is the division of the universe into two sexes and two genders, male and female and masculine and feminine. Obviously, trans people challenge the sex gender binary simply because they identify with a gender identity not associated with the sex they're assigned at birth. So, if you look at the circles diagram that I've created, you can see that there are three concentric circles and then one square. Let me explain the circles and the square. The smaller circle includes those we might identify as transsexual. That term has somewhat fallen into disuse, but it was very much a term of self-identification as well as a clinical term of diagnosis for many, many decades. Within that circle, there are three groups of people. Those who are seeking sex reassignment surgery, preoperative transsexuals, those who've obtained SRS or gender affirming or gender confirming surgery, post-op transsexuals, and those who do not seek SRS or GRS, non-op transsexuals. Obviously the term non-op explodes the category because we've defined transsexual as those who seek or have obtained sex reassignment surgery. There's a much larger category, which includes the transsexual, which is the people I would call transgendered. That includes anyone who presents fully in the gender not associated with their sex assigned at birth, at least part of the time. That would include not only transsexuals, but people who in the old days might have been identified as transvestites, 
Eddie Izzard still uses that term as a term of self-identification. Cross-dressers, a somewhat more up-to-date term. Also, those who might identify as or might be identified as drag queens or drag kings. It's important to recognize that those terms primarily refer to people who are engaged in some sort of performance, either on stage or in some festive setting, such as Halloween, a pride parade, or a costume party. There's a much larger circle that includes the two previous circles mentioned, and those are those people I would call the gender variant. Those are people who transgress gender norms to some extent. That would include, for example, somewhat feminine males who may still identify as men, somewhat masculine females who may still identify as women. Now, it's important to recognize here that most people in that category probably wouldn't use the term gender variant to self-identify. That's a term that I'm using, an analytic term, to categorize this group of people. It's also important to recognize, as I said before, that there are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and heterosexual people in all three circles. I contrast these three circles with a big square those who are conventionally gendered. Some people might use the term heteronormative, although that's a bit confusing because it suggests that they're all heterosexual. In fact, many, perhaps a majority of gay men and lesbians, for example, are conventionally gendered because they conform largely to the gender norms of their society. Uh, as I say, what you might call fun drag on Halloween at a pride parade or for a costume party doesn't count. Practically everyone has done that at some point in time. Um, the conventionally gendered are a majority in every society by definition because every society articulates gender norms that it imposes on its members. Those gender norms vary tremendously across different societies and cultures and time periods. Nonetheless, every society does articulate and enforce gender norms, sometimes through laws, also sometimes through violence. But most people in most time periods and most places largely conform to the gender norms of their society. However, those gender norms can change over time, as we've seen in European and North American societies over the course of the last half century. And when the subject of transitioning comes up in conversation, there's a tendency for people to look at it in the context of children. So what do you say to a person that says that a child is too young to know their gender identity? I would say that children instinctively understand who and what they are, even if they don't necessarily have a language for expressing that, even if it may take time for their understanding uh, to develop. Um, it's an unfolding process, but that's true of human development from birth through childhood, through adolescence to adulthood, even outside of the context of gender identity. Um, it is one of those strange myths which has diminishing valence when it comes to sexual orientation, but is still propagated with regard to gender identity. I think most reasonable people today understand that sexual orientation is not something that one is recruited into. If you think about it, most LGBTQ people grow up in heteronormative households. Yes, it is true that there's an increasing number of same-sex couples, of queer households, but there's still a very tiny minority. So most people grow up in heteronormative households and have to come to terms with their sexuality and or gender identity really on their own, often without 
parental or familial support, sometimes with parental and familial hostility. Um, increasingly, people understand that children are gay, lesbian, or bisexual and are not recruited or indoctrinated. They come to that realization themselves, often at a very, very early age, three, four, five, six. The same is true for transgender children. In many cases, they realize at an early age who and what they are. I knew I was transgendered at least from the age of four. Um, I didn't have that word. I didn't have the language to articulate that identity. And growing up in a Christian fundamentalist household, my parents were conservative Republicans uh, in Wisconsin in the 1960s. And so there were no quote unquote role models. There were no openly trans people in public life. Uh, there were a few figures. Um, Christine Jorgensen was the first person in the United States to be known to have undergone sex reassignment surgery. Later in the 1970s, Renee Richards transitioned, a very famous tennis player. But for the most part, there were no role models. There were no openly transgendered people. Uh, the only imagery was entirely negative uh, in terms of media representation on television and film. Um, there were obviously and still are um, TV shows and films that use some sort of drag, often as a joke, but there were no transgender people who spoke affirmatively of their identity in the media when I was growing up in Wisconsin in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so my realization of my own gender identity certainly didn't come from my family, certainly didn't come from the media or school. There were no openly gay, let alone openly trans uh, kids in my grade school, junior high or high school. Um, and certainly no teacher would ever talk about homosexuality, bisexuality, transgender in a classroom setting. I remember um, in junior high, we had to take one class in health, which included vague references to pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. But there was no reference to homosexuality, let alone transgender. So my recognition of my gender identity came from a recognition of my internal sense of self that was entirely unsupported by anything in my environment uh, growing up. And that's true for many, if not most, transgender children growing up now. Certainly things have changed a lot in the last half century. And there are cities, states, countries where it's becoming increasingly accepted, but it is still far from fully accepted in any country in the world. There's a huge amount of controversy in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and in other countries about children getting some form of medical intervention. It's a very complicated topic, so let me address this as succinctly as I can. First, obviously, adults should be free to seek whatever medical intervention they want, or conversely, to transition without medical intervention and have their government-issued identification changed. As for legal minors, I would say a few things. First, most children come to an understanding relatively early of who and what they are. Second, this whole notion that children 
are seeking or obtaining sex or assignment surgery is preposterous. I don't know of any cases in the U.S. or anywhere else where someone under the 18 has obtained sex or assignment surgery. It's important to recognize a few things. One, most trans men, those who are going from male to female, actually don't get phalloplasty, what they might they call bottom surgery. Most trans men tend to get just chest reconstruction, breast reduction or removal and chest reconstruction so that they have a very masculine male appearing chest. Secondly, with regard to those who are going from male to female, as I say, I don't know of a single case of someone under 18 getting vaginoplasty, sex reassignment surgery, GRS, uh, gender confirming surgery on their genitalia. Two things that some adolescents and pre-adolescents do get. Hormones, hormone replacement ther therapy, HRT, usually only after puberty, and even there, only through a licensed endocrinologist, and usually only with parental consent. So even there, it's not that common. The most common for pre-adolescents, the most common medical intervention um, is the use of what are called puberty blockers. Puberty blockers are not irreversible. All puberty blockers do is impede or postpone or delay the onset of secondary sex characteristics. So the body remains in the prepubescent state. Now, in the United States, and I'm sure this is true in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and most every other country, you can usually only get puberty blockers with parental consent. There might be very unusual circumstances where that could be uh, evaded. In most cases, I think in the US, that would be the relatively rare instance where someone who's 16 or 17 gets what they call legal emancipation. They're basically declared an adult. Um, that is very rare. It does happen, but it's very rare. And in those circum circumstances, then they could act legally as an adult. Without parental consent, most trans kids are unlikely to access any medical interventions. So this whole fear on the right that there's some massive wave of medical interventions with um, children and adolescents is completely irrational and completely baseless. A relatively small number of children are getting puberty blockers, but keep in mind, as I said, it's almost invariably with parental consent, and many parents are not supportive. Um, many kids understand that their parents aren't supportive and will not discuss it with them. I understood my parents would not be supportive or open, so I never discussed um, my gender identity with them. That doesn't mean I didn't have a gender identity. It just meant that I realized I had to wait until adulthood to be able to actualize and express that gender identity. Um, and as I said, in almost every case, it requires parental consent even to get puberty blockers, sometimes called beta blockers. And since most parents are not supportive, most trans kids will not be able to access those kinds of med medical interventions. One last thought here. If you think about kids having sex, when was parental prohibition against their children having sex before adulthood an effective deterrent from kids, from teenagers having sex? Answer, never. So if you think about medical interventions, 
trans kids who really want some sort of medical intervention might find ways around the requirement of parental consent. Here in the US, there are so-called shooting galleries where you can go for illicit drugs like heroin, for example. You can also get hormones illegally, essentially, unsupervised, which makes them more dangerous because they're not regulated. You don't know what you're getting. They might be imported. They might be adulterated with heroin or uh, uh, other illicit drugs. So you don't know what you're getting. It is much safer to have some sort of medical supervision by a licensed endocrinologist or other medical professional. But the fact is, teenagers and even preteens who have decided that they're transgendered or perhaps even non-binary and want some form of medical intervention may go to great lengths to get that medical intervention. So it is much better to have a structure in place where they can find informed support rather than trusting to the vagaries and the dangers of what you might call the black market, black market hormones and so forth. Um, a relatively small number of people, it's very tiny, at some point change their mind, but that is extremely rare. The whole issue of irreversibility is misconceived because if you think about it, in every other area of medical intervention, there are procedures performed that are irreversible. So for example, men can get vasectomies, right? Which are essentially irreversible. Um, they don't need some special permission to do so as long as they're an adult. There are all sorts of other kinds of medical interventions that you can get, gastric bypass surgery, etc., etc., that don't require any special permission or supervision. So why is it that people are obsessed with gender related medical interventions for legal minors when those are not very common and almost always require parental consent which is not very often forthcoming it's kind of a trans panic you know the term sex panic. It's kind of a gender panic. Uh, there's a kind of a trans panic around this that reflects irrational fears of transgender identity. And what's an irrational fear? A phobia. Transphobia is still pervasive in American society, in British society, European society, in many other uh, societies and cultures. So instead of focusing obsessively on medical interventions for legal minors, we should instead focus on creating societies that are healthy and accepting of anyone regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation, where there are existing structures that can help support children and adolescents who are coming to terms with their gender identity and or sexual orientation. It's within those existing structures, supportive informed structures, that young people can get informed support. And some people might think through the long-term consequences and decide it's not for them. It's quite possible. Or they might have a social transition. They might declare themselves to be trans or non-binary without medical intervention, or they might get a relatively less 
non-invasive medical intervention, like puberty blockers, which are temporary and reversible. It's about creating supportive structures where young people can get informed support so they can make decisions in consultation, one would hope, with supportive parents and other adults, rather than trying to ban medical interventions, which are relatively rare to begin with. A big fear in some circles is that being transgender is something that can be taught, that trans people are somehow teaching or influencing others to become trans. Why do you think that some people believe this? Well, it's really silly in a way, and it harkens back to uh, the 70s and 80s when there was this widespread fear that homosexuality could be taught. Um, most people now understand that that was a misconception and that that doesn't happen. But that's partly because more and more people know openly gay and lesbian people um, and hear their stories. It's still the case that very few people know openly transgendered people, and so they harbor this misconception. You can't really teach transgender. What you can do is teach the history of transgender. You could teach about media representation. You can teach about gender identity and sexual orientation, what they are, what they're not. But simply because you're in a classroom where something is discussed doesn't necessarily mean that that will change your gender identity. Gender identity is pretty firmly rooted in an internal sense of self. And so it is extremely unlikely uh, that anyone would shift their gender identity simply because someone is talking about it. What could happen is someone who thinks they might be trans or non-binary, if they're in an affirming environment or even one of open intellectual curiosity, might find information that help would help inform their coming to terms with their gender identity. That much is true, but that's very different from saying that transgender is somehow being taught, which is not true. Um, there are still very, very few public schools in the United States, and I'm sure the same is true in the United Kingdom, where any LGBT positive education is being offered in public schools or as the British would say, state schools. At the university level, there might be a few courses, usually almost always uh, what we would call electives in your third or fourth year as an undergraduate or perhaps in graduate school. But for the most part, most Americans, and I think this is undoubtedly true in the United Kingdom as well, go through life entirely unexposed to any kind of formal education around sexual orientation, let alone gender identity. So the very strange fears that some people have that young people are indoctrinated into transgender uh, are really totally irrational. Quite the contrary. The real situation is that um, children in adolescents who might be transgendered or non-binary lack access to credible information and affirming environments in which they can come to a full understanding of their gender identity and actualize that gender identity. Something that I hear occasionally is that being transgender or gender fluid is a kind of fad or trend, something that's just part of current times. What do you tell people when you hear that? I think that it is certainly true that is grow there is growing acceptance, but the notion that transgender identity is a fad, 
is completely historical because there have been people like me in some fashion since the beginning of time, since the beginning of recorded history. We're only recognizing now, at least some of us, that there is this whole history and even prehistory of people uh, who I would call proto-transgender. I came up with that term uh, to indicate, to reference those who in previous areas anticipate contemporary transgender identity, because the term transgender obviously is a neologism and has only been in common use really for about 30 or 40 years. However, there have been people who in some significant aspect anticipate contemporary transgender identity in every pre-modern culture and society. I have a presentation on PaulingPark.com about queer and trans API history, uh, people in the Asia Pacific region who in the pre-modern era anticipated contemporary transgender and LGBTQ identities. So if you put proto, P-R-O-T-O, hyphen transgender with an A-L in the search box on PaulingPark.com, that blog post will come up. Uh, and it goes into great detail about Asian and Pacific Islander cultures and the place of people who today we would call LGBTQ, gay, bisexual, transgender, in pre-modern Asian and Pacific Islander societies going back over 2,000 years. As I like to say, it's not just as queer nation would have it, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. That was their famous slogan. We have been queer, we have been here, but you just forgot. Sadly, misconceptions about the trans community can lead to not only misunderstandings, but also harm against transgender people or even people suspected of being transgender. But that's where activism comes into play. And you're one of the leading activists for trans rights in America, having helped create organizations such as the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy. Pauline, what else needs to be done to help the trans community? Well, we certainly need more comprehensive legislation, both in all 50 states here in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and especially in countries where trans and LGBTQ people face comprehensive oppression, discrimination, abuse, harassment, and violence. Above all, we need public education, which is, I think, where this segment uh, on your program will help by contributing to an education of the public on this important issue. Some of the most important interactions are relatively casual conversations with friends, with colleagues, coworkers, family members, neighbors. Um, so I would encourage anyone who is interested and who believes that all human beings deserve full human rights to educate themselves and to engage in conversations with others. You don't need to be an activist or an expert on transgender to advance an agenda of social justice. You just need to be there and be supportive. It can start, for example, if you're going to various websites, as I mentioned, my website, pointingpark.com. I have a ton of stuff on transgender issues on my website. I also have the circles diagram, as I mentioned, 
It can involve going to the websites of different organizations in the US, the UK, and elsewhere. One organization that I've been involved with, which has merged with another organization, it was founded as transgender, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, but it merged with uh, the Transgender Law Center recently to become Advocates for Trans Equality, and their website is a numeral 4 te dot org, a 4 te dot org. That is an organization here in the United States that's based in New York and San Francisco that assists trans people, particularly with legal issues. There are organizations uh, in the UK, in Europe, and beyond. Another organization people can go to is Outright International, and their website is outrightinternational.org, Outright International, one word, dot org. And they are active in almost every country in the world. They do tremendous work, particularly in countries where LGBTQ people are facing institutionalized discrimination. Every country in the world is being challenged by the pervasive discrimination, abuse, harassment, and violence that transgendered and non-binary people face. It really behooves us all to be supportive, to educate ourselves, and to take action. I'd also like to mention another organization that's doing tremendous work, that's Alcaus, A-L-Q-A-W-S dot O-R-G. Alcaus is the LGBTQ advocacy organization for Palestinians living under illegal occupation in illegally occupied Palestine. And they are working both to educate the Palestinian community on LGBTQ issues and advocate for LGBTQ Palestinians uh, living under occupation in Palestine. Um, it's really important, particularly at this time, as we are in the midst of the worst genocide of the century to date, uh, to support queer Palestinians. Uh, we don't know how many people in Gaza, for example, would identify as trans, as non-binary, as queer, if they had that opportunity. Uh, it's just important to support trans people around the world, in every country, and especially in countries and regions and territories where they face not only homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, but other forms of state-sanctioned and societal oppression. Well, it's been great talking to you, Pauline. I just want to thank you for taking the time to come on to the show today. I will leave links to your website, social media, as well as important links for the trans community in the description below. And hopefully we can have you back on the show in the very near future. Thanks so much, Mark. It's been a real pleasure to be on with you. Uh, I'm hoping that your viewers and listeners uh, find this segment informative and that they continue to educate and inform themselves on these important issues.